Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my friend and our guest speaker, Mr. Mike Olivier. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's nice to see so many people who are members of the Committee of 100 being members of the Baton Rouge Rotary Club, which I know to be one of the largest of over 30,000 Rotary Clubs in the world. Um, as I was telling you earlier, um, Anthony and Deborah Sternberg are Committee 100 members. Uh, I, I appreciate the many hours that they put into supporting the work that we do as a nonpartisan organization and being Louisiana's business roundtable. A lot of people don't know that the Committee of 100 is Louisiana's business roundtable. We're not a Chamber of Commerce. We don't intend to be. We're members of our Chamber of Commerce called Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. Serve on committees. Uh, our immediate past chair, Sonia Perez, was chair of the State Chamber, LABI. So we work together with a lot of groups, including uh, the Public Affairs Research Council, and the Council for a Better Louisiana, which we'll talk about more uh, later. But our organization is comprised not just of big companies, but of many companies whose CEOs are predisposed to want to make a difference in terms of affecting public policy in Louisiana. And that's the focus. As a business roundtable, we join 35 other states who have business roundtables uh, throughout the United States. We are loosely affiliated with the National Business Roundtable at a headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we pretty much follow the same track that they do, focusing on things like workforce, workforce development, education as a part of that, and other issues including criminal justice reform, tax reform, state finances, and those things that impact business and economic development directly. Uh, it's not very well known that uh, in the last nine years, the department of Economic Development has been in a memorandum of understanding with the private sector nonpartisan group called the Committee of 100, Louisiana's Business Roundtable. And this memorandum of understanding has been developed and continued over the past years uh, as we've gone through two governors and now uh, continuing into this governor's second term where we provide support to the Economic Development Agency for our state of Louisiana, and that's private sector support. And so how does that affect anything that we do? Well, along with affecting public policy measures, we also look to support the programs that the Department of Economic Development has online, including mentoring and working with them as they look to bring more business to Louisiana. So. You can see that is why many of our leading private and public sector companies, professional firms, and even around a dozen university presidents, senior executives are members of the Committee of 100. You know, the, the organization started in 1992. Uh, it was based here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but it's a statewide organization. Uh, some people will remember that uh, it, it started what was called the Select Council of Revenue and Expenditures in Louisiana's Future. That acronym was termed SECURE. In 1990s, mid-1990s, it led to a commission being formed. Uh, Governor Mike Foster, whom has been in the news lately, um, who is 90 years old and, and currently it seems that uh, this, these may be his last week's on this earth uh, was a part of that, a big part of that. And over $2 million was raised by the Committee of 100 members and other businesses resulting in a Pete Marwick study that provided about 173 um, recommendations that were passed and implemented by the legislature. And 77 of those were partially implemented. Now in 2014, we're gonna fast forward where here we have the Department of Economic Development working in tandem with the Committee of 100, Louisiana's Business Roundtable, and seeking how can we make Louisiana a better place for business and industry and do what's right to make Louisiana a better place to live and work. And in 2014, we started a process of tax reform pushing on tax reform. And what we did was, is we got engaged with the National Tax Foundation in Washington, D.C., 
who examined Louisiana's overall tax structure. And I'll tell you, for years, they have been a public policy group, nonpartisan public policy group that examines and grades and ranks every state on their tax policies. And so Louisiana, I know you know this, has consistently ranked one of the lowest. And so what we wanted to do is to find out what is it going to take for Louisiana to be a better place for business? What is it going to take for Louisiana to be a better place to live for our individuals, our citizens? And what we found was in that process, we needed to compress the rates and broaden the base for personal income tax. We needed to do the same thing for corporate income tax. And you needed to do these in tandem because you can't give a tax break or change the tax laws for one and not the other. So we're talking about personal income tax and corporate income tax. And then we needed to reduce and align sales tax rates be between the local and state jurisdictions. And that causes for us to have a need for a centralized sales tax administration and collections, especially in this day of the internet and internet sales. Now let's go forward from 2014 to 2017, where the legislature took note of this study that was done and paid for by the Committee of 100, and they commissioned the Task Force on Structural Change in Budget and Tax Policy also known as HCR 11 Task Force. Now this task force was 13 people who were appointed and because we never really got any traction in the legislature, this led to us coming in 2019 with uh, work on the Louisiana legislature where we had term limits having its largest turnover ever and all statewide elected officials were up for re-election and this created a large loss of what we call institutional knowledge. In other words, a lot of people in the legislature, like John Lario, had been there for 40 plus years, some not as and not as long. But the point is, when you lose that institutional knowledge, there's a lot to be known as you're going through this process. We started a group called Reset Louisiana, and it was a nonpartisan effort that was led by the Committee of 100 with the Council for Better Louisiana and the Public Affairs Research Council in response to this need to change some things, particularly in those four areas. And our goal was to create some practical public policy opportunities in the 2020 legislative cycle. So we began a process and it was a year long effort to educate policymakers, people running for office on, and on the reset agenda. And what we wanted to do was to help them to know where we've been in the past with these issues and what are the things that needed to be changed and that we would provide the support to them as they made and voted for these changes. So there are four key policy topics. The first was education, and these are workforce issues. Obviously, as a business group, we're very interested in the workforce equation. State finances uh, being everything from our pension reform to tax reform, the criminal justice or public safety areas where we have so many people who are incarcerated in our state that it's costing us an enormous amount of money, probably the highest per capita cost in the United States in terms of incarceration and transportation infrastructure. And you all being here in Baton Rouge, we do not need to preach about the need for transportation improvement of our roads, but this is going beyond just our roads and bridges. This is going to the point of transportation overhaul for maritime, for our airports, for anything that has to do with moving commerce. And that's very important and critical for us to be a more attractive place to bring business and industry to Louisiana. So here we are in 2020. COVID-19 has created a public health and economic challenge. We've never seen anything like this before. And by March, the regular session of our legislature was suspended, disrupted by uh, all policymaker and stakeholder plans relative to the 2020 legislative cycle. So we all had to basically pause. And given the challenge of this virus, we uh, at the research, reset team developed a set of priority recommendations for the immediate term. And that was to see where we could go. And so the immediate recommendations for 2020, again, having a workforce approach to it, was ensuring that child care centers can operate at capacity. Now, you know, again, it's a workforce issue. I, so many people depend on the child care centers, early childhood development. These are not babysitting centers. These are educational centers. We need to educate. We need to do more 
in the education field. Starting people early, we're convinced, we all are convinced that the earlier we start them, the better. And their parents are working. So if they can go to a place that's qualified and they can learn, then we can help the workforce capacity issue. And we need to require that every school district has a continuing learning plan. As we learn, the disruption created by this pandemic could be created by any other catastrophic event. So we needed to have, what is the learning plan? What are the options? And that leads to technology. What's the technology plan? And all of this deals with how do we get this information and how do we make sure that there's a transparency so that the school districts and the parents and the people who are stakeholders know that their kids are going to be taken care of and there will not be a huge pause. We're all worried about where we're gonna be at the end of this year in terms of our kids having been out of school for a period of time, coming back into school, the uncertainty of not knowing if you're gonna do a hybrid program, if you're gonna be in person, if you're gonna be uh, online, what about the technology aspects of being online? So there's a lot to uh, the issue of educating our workforce, our workforce of the future. Next, it's the target investments in technology. And with the federal recovery money that we're getting for education, we need to start focusing on where we're putting this money so that we can enhance what we have in terms of the technology network. And providing a quick turnaround for workforce training is evident in the numbers that we've lost, particularly in the entertainment and recreational areas of our state, the tourism areas of our state, the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, all of so many of these people have lost their jobs. We need to find a quick turnaround, which is why the governor has, has authorized a $15 million investment in our community college system so they can train 15,000 people between uh, accreditations in two-week programs up to 10-week programs so we can train as many as 15,000 people in a lot of different areas that are quantified, qualified areas of need. In other words, they might be going from working in a hotel to being engaged in the IT industry. And then what we need to do is to pursue tax changes that improve the chances of recovery. And these are measured by the impact on state revenues and the long-term reforms that we're looking at. So what we're talking about is a balance here. You can't just give everything away. You can't just open the cash box and, and go in the debt to the point that our national government has, but we need to learn what are the best decisions that we can make. And here we are uh, using the reset principles to help educate our public, but also work with our legislature who have to make some very, very tough decisions. We're continuing to provide uh, subsidies to assist low-income workers. Uh, that, that means uh, people who don't have uh, the, the money is necessary to continue on to pay their rent, to pay for, for transportation, to get to work. And then what we need to do is to look at continuing uh, sentencing reform progress. We've, we've made some inroads in 2017 and 2018. We don't need to back up on those. Um, these reform efforts that were made to curtail some of the long-term incarceration costs associated with nonviolent crimes is in fact saving us money. And so what we're doing is we're launching, partnering with other groups uh, so that we can have a public awareness campaign over the next couple of years that's designed and developed by a newly organized group called the Second Look Alliance. Uh, some of that is uh, some of the founders of that are members of the Committee of 100 who have taken this to heart, looking for ways that we can make a difference in the area of these incarcerations and changing uh, our system so that we can save tax dollars while at the same time maintaining security. And we need to maximize our state surplus spending on transportation and other infrastructure projects, uh, which, is, which is what we did uh, during the course of this first special session by taking some of the money that we had, about $535 million surplus that was that was uh, in the fiscal year 2019. And uh, that spending was restricted to a few categories, including contributions to the rainy day fund and pay downs on the state retirement debt and one-time expenses such as transportation and other types of infrastructure and construction projects. What we needed to do 
was to was to offer the the support of our leadership throughout the state, over 128 people who are members of the Committee of 100, to support our legislators again in making some business decisions that make a difference. And looking ahead for 2021, here we are right now, the first week in a second special session. Uh, we're looking forward to how can those reset priority issues uh, in the four areas that we've been focusing on, how can they uh, be applied to anything that's going on uh, during this special session? But our main focus, obviously, is going to be in 2021. And again, that's going to be dealing with education, state finances, public safety, and transportation infrastructure. I know that there's a limited time frame that uh, I can speak to Rotary, but what I wanted to do now was to leave some time so we can have a Q&A, so we can talk to your membership uh, from the Committee of 100 on items that may be, be of interest to you relative to what is the Committee of 100, what do we do, and how we do it. That's great. Yeah, um, that's a lot of useful information, uh, Michael. And one of the uh, first questions Rob Wise asked is, how does one get involved or be invited into uh, participate with the Committee of 100? Well, I think you should uh, go to our website, www.c100la.org, and you can see that there is uh, some qualifications that we're looking for. You can complete a form and uh, merely uh, refer that on over uh, to our office, and that will be contemplated by our executive committee. Uh, we're looking for people, again, you need to be a private sector individual, not an elected individual. We have a prohibition against elected officials being members. But what we're looking for are people who are in certain sectors of business and certain sectors of the state. Uh, we're always looking to be as diverse as we possibly can. Uh, we're always looking to be in every region of our state, the eight regions of our economic regions of our state. And we're looking for those people, those leaders in those companies who are predisposed to want to make a difference and using their influence with our legislature to affect public policy measures. So going forward, I know we're, we're, we've got this, this limited special session coming up right here. What are some of the legislative agendas looking forward into the next year and, and, and on out over, over the next several cycles? Well, this special session uh, has uh, 70 items of interest that these legislators have put forth uh, it's almost like a regular session, frankly. And uh, of that, they're going to go and spend uh, uh, millions of dollars on what is a 30-day session lasting until October 27th. Uh, I'm not sure. So far, we've seen about 60 bills that are being that have been filed and are being referred to committee and are being heard in committee. Of that, most of these bills look like they are bills that didn't make it during the regular session of 2020 and during the first special session of 2020. In addition, there are bills that are seeking to curtail the executive privilege that the governor has relative to catastrophic event management. Uh, we're not sure exactly how that's going to play out or what the outcome is going to be. Um, many of the relevant issues that we have in our reset program dealing with things like the state finances, pension plans, and all of that, uh, those haven't been addressed in the legislature yet. We have not seen any bills thus far that really impact those areas. But we do expect that there's going to be some activity during this session that's going to be setting up bills for the regular session in 2021, which doesn't begin until April. And so with that in mind, we are every day looking at what bills are filed, what bills are heard, and what is said about these bills. Because if you understand the legislature as we're trying to, and that is not an easy chore, uh, we're trying to figure out who's introducing the bill, what is the intent of the bill. In many cases, they're trying to show a hand to see what, to gauge what is the support or opposition to any action that might be taken in uh, setting up a similar bill for a following session. And remember the session in 2021 
uh, is going to be a really important session uh, because we're going to be dealing with an awful lot of issues, including uh, a catastrophic event uh, costs, this pandemic event, the hurricane events, the flood events, which are continuing um, and, and going into uh, what will be another fiscal cliff situation for our state since it's going to affect the tax revenues that we have. We've got to have tax reform. We've got to have education investment. It's the future in terms of our workforce. So how do we build best to come back as an economy to build our business and industry and make us a competitive state? That's that's a, a great question. What are some of your ideas? What are some of the, the, the things that the Committee of 100 would like to push forward for some specific reforms? Specific reforms in the area of taxes. We've got to streamline the tax process. We have to change the tax code. We have to make these more, how would you say, um, a broader tax base. We've got to moderate some of the tax exemption privileges. And these are not just for business and industry. These tax exemptions exist as many or more tax exemptions exist for individuals as are for business and industry. And we've got to remain competitive in terms of keeping the businesses that we have, but also bringing new businesses to Louisiana. Okay. Uh, not seeing a whole lot of questions just as of yet. I think one of the questions I, I would like to know when, when the committee of 100 is, is putting together, formulating your ideas or your, the things that you're wanting to take back to the, to the legislature, are you concentrating on specific areas? So if you, if you have members who are in one sector versus another, they take those expertise and take, take their leadership in, in that role. Do that, do you break out your information that way or is it just a, a collective group? Once again, we, we focus on the specific areas I mentioned in terms of workforce issues, education, which applies to workforce, state finances, which covers everything from pension to tax reform, uh, and areas of transportation infrastructure and public safety. Those are the four main areas. But what we do is we depend on those businesses and those business leaders who have expertise in those areas. Plus, we focus on our partners. People like the Council for a Better Louisiana, for an example, have over the many years that they've been in existence, have distinguished themselves as becoming experts in the education area, whether it's early childhood education, K through 12, or higher education, post-secondary education areas. So we depend on them in terms of their think tank capacity. We also depend on groups like the Public Affairs Research Council, who as Louisiana's think tank, is not an advocacy group, but what they do is they study and analyze what are the issues, and they'll give you, just like they released today, uh, a very good document on the seven constitutional amendments that you and I will have to vote on on November 3rd relative to the Louisiana State Constitution. And what they do is they present, they study, they research and give you some very good information about the pros and cons of the bill, of the amendment as it's on the ballot. And what does it mean? Uh, there's also um, a short form, if you will, so you understand, okay, if this passes, this is what it does. If it fails, this is what it does. And so uh, it, it helps to give and educate our voters because it's complicated. When you get into the voting booth, and if you haven't read those seven amendments, it's going to be very contemplate, very uh, different and hard for you to make a determination on what's the right choice. And we'd rather you vote for the right thing and, and not waste your vote. So we oftentimes partner with those groups. Other groups that we partner with, for instance, uh, Louis, the group that calls themselves uh, the Committee to Fix Our Roads. Uh, we've partnered with them since they were established three years ago because there is a need to fix our roads and bridges in Louisiana. We partner, partner with uh, the World Trade Center in New Orleans uh, because of international trade and the need to support international trade. And also we partner with Louisiana Association of Business and Industry along with other groups that are industry sector groups like the Louisiana Chemical Association, 
Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association, and others. Chris Delia asks, Michael, about five years ago, we were involved in a successful C-100 trade mission to Panama. Is any follow-up planned? Oh, Christopher, Dr. Delia, what a great guy. He was, uh, he's a trooper, I'll tell you what. He's not afraid of going someplace and asking for the business. And um, we are continuing that. This COVID thing has set that aside for some time now. Uh, Christopher, our last visit uh, was after the visit that you made. In fact, uh, the Committee of 100 membership went to Panama. Uh, we participated in meetings with the airline that ultimately did locate to Louisiana, uh, among other industry-related meetings. But now we've been focusing, as you know, on the Mexican states that border the Gulf of Mexico. And we're working in tandem with the Department of Economic Development, and they have a program that is a federally funded program, which is called the State Trade Promotions Department, the STEP program, State Trade Export Promotions, uh, which allows for funding to businesses like yours that want to go to someplace and market their products. So they pay for some of the costs associated with your travel, including your airfare, your registration, your hotel expenses, not the total amount, but about half of the amount. That's quite an impressive amount of dollars that can be invested in our Louisiana businesses. And what we're doing is we are working with a program that was started by Jeb Bush about 35 years ago, when Jeb Bush was the, uh, was the governor of the state of Florida. And the five states from Florida to Texas and bordering the Gulf of Mexico, and the seven states bordering the Gulf in Mexico started a process of meeting twice annually for business exchange, including academic exchange, which Christopher Delia has been a great proponent of. Uh, and we're going to be doing that again uh, this January. Now, we're going to the state of Tabasco. Uh, in recent years, we have done a meeting in New Orleans. We've done a meeting in Merida. We've done a meeting in Lafayette, Louisiana, and we've done a meeting in Campeche. The next state that we were going to is Tabasco. And lo and behold, the new ambassador, well, the new consular, uh, consul general to the United States representing Mexico is from the state of Tabasco. And when he came to New Orleans this past year, he announced that he would like to lead a business delegation to Villahermosa in the state of Tabasco. Now, some of our businesses in Louisiana have some offices and activities in uh, the state of Tabasco. The University of Louisiana Lafayette happens to have a relationship with the university there in the Hermosa. So we're looking forward to bringing businesses who can do business with the Mexican uh, business group uh, who are specifically in the areas of oil and gas industry, but also uh, Oxner is very interested in Telmed. We have universities who are interested in agribusiness opportunities. Uh, our Department of Agriculture here, our Commissioner of Agriculture, is very supportive of attending and working with us to promote, uh, particularly in the foods areas. Uh, and also the transportation industry is very interested because we already have existing transportation uh, projects that are happening between the Mississippi River and the many states bordering the Gulf of Mexico in Mexico. Uh, and so we're looking forward to being able to, we're starting the promotion now. Uh, we're just releasing an announcement on that uh, at, on Friday uh, by the Department of Economic Development and the World Trade Center. In addition, uh, we'll be going during the week of um, the second week of, of January uh, and we'll be bringing companies who are going to be supported by the STEP program, the federal program, to pay for part of their expenses. Awesome. Chris did post an, a follow-up. He said that LSU also has a relationship with the same university in Villahermosa. There you go. Way to go, Chris. Yeah, we, Chris is a great guy, really great Rotarian. Uh, I don't see any further questions, Mr. Lovier. Uh, do you have any closing comments you wanted to, to I would go like with? To ask, I would like to ask everybody to really pay attention. Um, if you have not promoted the census count among your businesses, among your stakeholders, your clients, please do that. Uh, it, it closes out October 5th. Louisiana is we're concerned about being undercounted. This means 
millions and millions of dollars for the next decade to Louisiana. The importance is very important. And I'm not even mentioning a perhaps loss of a Congress congressional seat in Louisiana. Beyond that, it's about the money. And if we don't get a full count, and right now we're in the high 80% area, but we need to get closer to that 100% mark where we can count everybody in the state so we can get full funding. So we encourage all Rotarians. You've got 500 people who can touch another 500 people and go beyond that. So in the next few days, if you've got a, a neighborhood uh, association, if you've got a, a social uh, online presence, social media online presence, whatever you can use, please encourage people to sign up. It takes takes four or five minutes to answer the, the, the census data uh, online. You can do it. And we thank you for supporting Louisiana. Thank you to the Rotary Club and so many of its members and Certainly, my members who are members of the Rotary Club, I admire them for uh, participating in what I think to be one of the greatest organizations in the world. We did get one, one last question real quick from Todd Lowry. He said, the state legislature recently made changes to the ANGEL tax credit to entice more capital deployment to startups. Do you see the legislature or the uh, Committee 100 undertaking initiatives for startup growth? Well, the Committee 100 would be supportive of that surely. Uh, but what we're going to be seeing is uh, the Department of Economic Development seeking the legislature's support on enhancing these angel tax credits to get more capital deployment uh, in the market. Some of our members with the Committee of 100 actually are engaged in venture capital uh, uh, in Louisiana. And this is a great way, and it's been demonstrated over the past 20 years, as a great way to encourage more people to invest in Louisiana companies. Right. Again, Michael, thank you very much for spending some time here with us today. A lot of great information. Um, and, and we will encourage our, our members to, to make sure everyone does that census to help, help us get all those numbers, but also reach out to the, the Council of 100's uh, website. What's the, the web address again for the Council? Yes, it's www.c100la.org. Awesome. We invite you to look at that. Also, please look at reset-louisiana.net because that is where we have our reset program outlined and we look for anybody to investigate that and input on that. All of those principles that we uh, talked about today are included there for your perusal. Thank you again. Thank you.